Hello and welcome to another edition of Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine Nkrumah and you're watching Diaspora Network Television. This version, this edition of Diaspora Weekly will be very eye-opening. Uh, we're going to give you some uh, pretty good information about an area that is on everybody's mouth, but about which very few people know enough about. But I'm not going to tip my hand yet. Because as usual, before we go to my guests, we have to do the Django. So stay tuned for the Django. In today's Django, I want to travel across the Atlantic to the United States uh, to weigh in on something that everybody has been talking about for the last couple of days. If you watch the Oscars, the MC of an Oscar, it is his job to make jokes, to entertain the audience. And the, I mean, audience, not just those in-house, but globally. It's the tradition. Some of the jokes will be appropriate, but wherever you have a situation like that, it's not far-fetched to anticipate that some of the jokes will really bomb flat out. And some of them will be outright of, of offensive, as was in the case of Sunday, when Chris Rock made a joke about Will Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett, who is battling a disease that causes hair loss. Now, it is true that she herself has talked about the disease openly, uh, so it's no secret. But a disease is a disease, and when someone jokes about it, it can be very offensive. And so when Chris Rock made a joke about Jada Pinkett's hair loss, initially, the husband sitting next to him smiled. He actually laughed about it. But something must have kicked in inside him. He just got up, walked right to the stage, and did something that has never happened at the Oscars before. He actually slapped um, Chris Rock on live TV <laughs> on stage. Now, for one, I felt like in as much as Chris Rock's joke was beyond the pale, Will Smith's action was farther beyond the pale. Okay? Um, walking onto a stage on live television to slap somebody is completely uncle. I, don't, I do not care what the cause is, even though all of us agree that uh, he hit someone, um, he joked about his wife. Could Will Smith have waited until backstage and approach Chris Rock with his wife and demand an apology? I think he would have achieved the same objective and the, the, the press would have uh, picked up on it that Chris Rock 
apologize or Will Smith made Chris Rock apologize to his wife. That would have been a classier way to handle it. But to walk on stage and resort to violence for someone who has worked over a long period of time earning respect, including mine, I can tell you, Sunday he lost me. I understand about defending your family, and all of us will defend our family. If someone attacked my wife like that to a global audience, I would, I would seek uh, some type of uh, revenge. But I think it could have been done in a classier way. I'm sure a lot, of people, uh, a lot of people disagree with me on this. Indeed, on Facebook, there are people who feel like he's right for doing so. But from Jermaine's angle, Will Smith, you went too far. And whatever comes to you, people are talking about, yeah, whatever he's going through, yes, we get that. There's not a single person who walks on the planet who's not going through one thing or another. But we don't walk around smacking people on the side of the head who does things wrong to us, particularly on live TV, on stage in front of a global audience. Will Smith, you, Chris Rock did something wrong, but now you are the one on the chopping block, and you deserve every single bit of it. For today, that's the jungle. Stay tuned, and you meet my guest. speak to you. I know the stress people go through when they want to send money from abroad to their family members and loved ones in Ghana and in even Africa. See, if you are in the USA, eh? if you are in London, UK, Canada, you know, Europe, any part of the world, see, tap tap send has made it very easy. All you have to do is to tap and tap and send. Within a twinkle of an eye, your money will be sent with no stress. It's very fast, convenient, and easy to access everywhere. What are you waiting for? Just tap, tap, <laughs> and send. <laughs> Download Tap Tap Send now on Google Play and App Store. Tap Tap Send. It's secure, convenient, easy, and fast. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. My name is Jermaine Nkrumah, and I'm joined by Ambassador Shirley Abedi Boafo. Welcome. Thank you. Your resume is a few pages long. And so what we do here at Diaspora Weekly, we, we don't do the introduction. We let you introduce yourself to the people. But before you do that, I want viewers to look at this. Specialized water, the best. Don't take my word for it. Try it. And also, you just saw Tap Tap Send. If you download the app and use DNT as your code, you get $10 or 5 euros or 5 pounds towards your first transaction. So that's for your information. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for having me. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. You are an NGO person, but before we go there, I want to talk to you about you. Okay. You're an ambassador, Your Excellency. And in fact, you, uh, as an ambassador, you are referred to as Your Excellency. No. <laughs> right? So tell us about yourself. Who okay. is Ambassador Shirley Abedi Boafo? Okay. Ambassador Shirley Abedi Boafo um, is a wife, mm -hmm. mother of four, mm -hmm. two girls, and two boys. Mm -hmm. And Ambassador Shirley is very passionate about empowering the nonprofit sector in Ghana. Okay. Yeah. Empowering. Let's start with, how did you, you become ambassador? Okay, I became an ambassador. There was a merit, a merit award okay. just last year. Mm. Um, the, it was a conferred on, on me because of the work that we do with the non-profits. Actually, I went to a friend of mine, well, not a friend, one of our um, board members from the UK came to Ghana to go and um, support a particular charity. Mm -hmm. So we went along to go and help, to help her to, you know, support the charity that she works with. So whilst we're supporting, um, someone just came. I, I, I've never known him. So as we were speaking, we got to find out the work that we do for the NGOs in Ghana. They decided to award, award me the Merit Award because of the work that we do with that. So it, the Basel post is for the um, work that we do for humanitarian. Oh, OK. Yeah. Does it come with any perks? 
Not at the moment. Yes, <laughs> yes Ambassador. <laughs> because but, yes. your car is outside. Do you, do you have a CD plate? Or regular plate. <laughs> regular plate. Oh, come on. <laughs> Ambassador, maybe you should go and get uh, a CD plate. So, um, how, <clears throat> tell us about yourself. Where did you grow up? Okay. I grew up in Kumasi. I was born in Kumasi. Okay. Went to primary school in Kumasi. Secondary school, I went to Yasan Swagel Secondary School. Oh, my goodness. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you what private school, but Yasan Tua. Yes. Hmm. You know Yasantua's, uh, uh, when you say Yasantua, it comes with a whole lot. You know that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about school days in Yasantua. Oh. I'm trying very hard to be nice, but I have a tease for Yasantua. Because oh I'm a Kwasi boy also. But yes, uh, so continue. You went to Yasantua. I went to Yasantua and Secondary else. School. Mm -hmm. And I went to Kumasi Polytechnic. Okay. And I went to the UK. Mm -hmm. I went to um, Hammersmith and West London College. Okay. Then I got married. Okay. Had my kids. Okay. Decided to move back to Ghana. Uh -huh. 1998. I moved back to Ghana to stay for two years. Uh -huh. And I went back. Had my three kids within a short period of time. Okay. So I stayed in the UK, took care of my kids, went back to work. And then around, I think about... 15 years ago, I decided to go to work in the nonprofit sector in Ghana because that's what I've always wanted to do right. as a kid. So I've worked in the nonprofit sector over 20 years in, in the UK. When did you go to the UK first? Um, uh, many, many years ago. <laughs> I'm not going to let you get away with that. What year? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Um, I think 1986. 86. 86 okay. yeah. So now 86 and you return in 98. That's 12 years. Yeah. So 12 years and you decide, I mean, by that time, I'm sure you had finished with your tertiary education. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what made you decide to come back um, in such a short period of time, relatively of, speaking? Well, I mean, it, most people when you are going to UK, you don't plan to go and stay there forever. I didn't plan to go and stay there for very long. So I just wanted to go to university and come back to Ghana because mm -hmm. I love my country. Mm -hmm. So I came back to Ghana, but unfortunately, what I wanted at the time, my husband and I had a, a company whereby we were exporting pineapples to UK. Mm -hmm. No UK, sorry, in Europe. So we did that for two years and the business did not work as we wanted, so I really had to go back to, to, back to UK, yeah. Wow. So uh, they, did you have any kids before you returned? Or? Yes, I had one daughter. One? Yeah, okay, my and then when daughter. he went back, you I had, had the, the, three. The, okay. the three. Yeah. So if you were to go back to 98, so that means you came 98 and around 2000 you left mm -hmm. because two years. What do you think may have, did you, did you misread it? Did you misread the prospect of the business or uh, was it a case of uh, you had all your I's dotted and your T's crossed by something? was the reason why the business did not flourish? Um, there was the frustration. When, when I ran a business in Ghana, the frustration and the um, sometimes business partners are not too truthful to you. you. You export stuff to Europe and then they come back and tell you something different. You know, so at the time, I don't think I was ready at the time. Okay. I was not ready at the time, yeah. So we had to go back and then, yeah. Okay. So when you say business partners, where clearly if you're into exporting business, you have local partners and you have foreign partners. Yeah. So when you say partners were not truthful to you, which ones? Uh, the foreign to? partners. The foreign partners. Yeah. Okay. Because when we moved back, um, we did the business ourselves. We bought our own pineapples. We cleaned the pineapples ourselves. We weighed them, everything. So we shipped it ourselves. Okay. Even though we're working with um, some Ghanaian workers. but. Mainly, we run the business ourselves. So I'll say the foreign partners. So and also, there was so much frustration when you are shipping your pineapples to Europe. Because sometimes <laughs> you book the flights, and then they'll come and tell you, oh, it's fully booked. Meanwhile, we've done it already. So hmm. what happens is some, some, some people just go maybe give them more money. And then so there's so many frustrations because it was fresh fruit as well. It yeah, was very, very difficult. Go. Yes. Yeah. So you were exporting raw pineapples, not yes. canned. Okay. Yeah, raw pineapples. Wow, wow. Flying pineapples. Pineapples are heavy yeah. stuff. Yeah, so it, yeah. So it was a lot of money, a lot of money involved. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Mm. So, but I'm, uh, um, it's interesting that you say that 
<coughs> you had foreign partners and you had local partners. Yeah. Local partners were not a problem. The foreign partners, yeah. that were the problem. Yeah. But many people in the diaspora mm. have this notion that when you come back home, it's Ghanaians at home that would be untruthful mm. and that the foreign partners, mm. uh, that, that would be truthful. Speak to that, expand on that. Let me give me an example of how the locals did what they're supposed to do mm. to you, but it was rather the foreigners who basically spelled your downfall. Okay. So as I said, we were, we were on the ground mm -hmm. with the workers. I mean, we go to the farmer. I, I remember at the time, I was even pregnant with my first daughter. Mm -hmm. Go to the farm ourselves, you know, get the pineapples, clean ourselves, do everything ourselves. So you are in it. But why after you shift the pineapples over, sometimes they'll come back and tell the pineapples rotten. You are not there. So mm -hmm. you, you can't verify that. So stuff like that, yeah. And they didn't send you any pictures? No. Or anything? And were you dealing with, uh, when you say foreign partners, <laughs> were they Africans or were they? Europeans. Uh, Europeans. Yeah. This is interesting. And I want to highlight this because all of us <clears throat> out there, you hear people coming home. In your case, you were down with the farmers and they did do it truthful to you and yeah. everything. So then it begs the question, when you come to Ghana mm -hmm. to do business and they said, uh, well, uh, Ghanaians will frustrate you. From your vantage mm. point, mm. is it the rank and file Ghanaian that frustrates you, or is it the maybe the middle class or the upper echelon? To be honest, there were lots of. I mean, when you're doing business, guys, there's lots of frustrations okay. with the workers. Sometimes the way they work. You've ordered boxes. Let's say you're expecting the box to come today, it will not come. That frustration is there, mm -hmm. but that did not deter us because. As somebody said, that's the, that's the culture in Ghana. Right. So you just have to, you know, get on with the job, mm -hmm. you know. But the main frustration came when the pineapples get exported overseas mm -hmm. because obviously you are not there. You're right. So they come and tell, okay, the pineapples are rotten. What can you, what can you do? Okay. Maybe at the time we'd have told them, okay, can you send us some pictures? But yeah. we did not do that. Okay. So we just took their word for it. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. because of that, they won't pay. And then they won't pay. Your, your freight cost to be yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything would be yours. Yeah. Tell me your time in Europe, the 12 years. What was it like, school days and all? Um, it was okay. I think when I, when I went, went to UK, it was, it was a bit um, lonely, you know. And then um, nice as well. I made some friends. Very, very busy. You go to work. How did you get there for it to be lonely? You didn't go and stay with anybody? Oh, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, most of my family were in Ghana. Mm -hmm. My mom, my, everything was in Ghana. So I went to UK with myself, okay. with a family member. But obviously, as you know, you go and live with somebody, but you move out. Right. Yeah, but because I think because most of my family were in Ghana, maybe that's where I felt the lonely. But when I got married, everything, things changed. I got married, met my husband, got married, had my kids. Things changed. So but how my, long did you have to go through the lonely period? <laughs> maybe two when, years. Way, Not too did, long. <laughs> when did you meet your husband? I met my husband. Um, my daughter, my first daughter was born in 1993. But I met my husband 1991, 1992. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when you say that when you were in the farms, you were pregnant, you, you meant your second daughter. So my your, first daughter. Your first daughter. My first daughter, yeah. So your, your first child. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, your first child was a, a male. A female. A female. A female, yeah. Okay. But you say you, your, your first daughter was born in 93. 93, yeah. But you came to Ghana and you said, I think I wanted you to clarify. Okay. Because you said when you were in the farms uh, working with them, at that time you were pregnant with your first daughter. My first daughter was born in 1993. I was pregnant with her in London, 1993. Okay. Came to Ghana whilst I was pregnant with her. Second. S first one. Okay. Pregnant with her in 1990. I think I've, the dates are... Yeah, you say you, she was born in 93. 1993. But you came in 98 when you were working with the farmers and all. Sorry, it was 1992. It was 1992. 1992. Okay. Because I was pregnant with her in 1992. Okay. Gave birth to her in 1993, March. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it was between 1992 and 1993. That's when we were doing So the then you came, you, you spent only six years before yeah. you came back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so you pre pretty much hadn't even understood... Yeah. United Kingdom that much? That much, no. Really? I just wanted to come to <laughs> Yeah. But you had finished your tertiary yeah, education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So six years you come back and then two years later you pack up and, and leave. Yeah. And when you went back, uh, what was, 
I'd like to know what was in your mind on that plane ride back to London. I mean, after you've made you, okay, I went to school, came back to do business, two years, didn't work, I'm going back. What, what was that flight like? To be honest, I can't even remember, you know. Yeah. <laughs> many, many, many but years But in other ago. words, what's your, what's your, what was your state of mind when you got back on a plane and said, you know what, I've given up, I'm going back? What was your state well, of mind? Well, obviously, it wasn't easy, but I, I'm somewhat, I'm a very determined person. I just said to myself, I'm going back to the UK. At the time when I was, I was even pregnant with my second born. So, okay. so let me just go have my child and see what, what's next. Okay. But fortunately, after um, I've had my, my second born, the rest were very close to each other. Right. So I just had to stay put, okay. have the kids, look after them, and then right. look at the next step. So most people, mm -hmm. first and foremost, in, uh, in the diaspora, uh, the we did our poll and about 80% of Ghanaians said at some point they want to come back home, mm. which means there are 20% who say, forget, I'm not coming back home, mm. right? And so when you are part of the 80% and you come back mm. and you try the first time and it didn't work, you get on a plane, you go back. At that time, were you planning again to give it another chance or at that time you said, forget Ghana, I'm not coming back? Oh, Giving it another chance. Really? Yeah. Okay. And so you, that other chance came back after you've had the three children. Yes. Okay. So when did you come back the second time? The second, um, well, during that time, we come on holidays, but I finally decided to not quit my job, but come back and do the what I'm doing now, 2017. Oh, 2017, 2017 is when yeah. you came back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 93, 95, and then 17. So it took. Another uh, almost 22 mm. years yeah. to come back. Yeah. Okay. So now you're back. <laughs> how, how has it been? <laughs> Interesting, challenging, mm -hmm. exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first time when it didn't work, when you were facing challenges, you got on a plane and left. Mm -hmm. This time you're still facing challenges, but you're still here. What's yeah. different? Okay. The difference is um, the passion. And believing in what I'm doing. Because I believe that what I'm doing is needed in Ghana. And I'm very, very focused. I'm very, very convinced that I'm in my area. And no matter the challenges, it's going to work. Okay. Because there's a need for what we are doing in Ghana at the moment. Okay. You know, <laughs> that's a great answer. Do you know why? Because I've always believed... Uh, and in business, most mm. counselors will advise you that when you're going to business, two things. You either must be passionate, passionate yeah. about what you, the, the subject matter in which you're doing business, mm -hmm. or you must be good at it. Yeah. And there's a difference. Some people can be good at something without having a passion for it. Mm -hmm. Some people can have passion without necessarily being good for it. But if you have both, mm -hmm. no matter how long it takes, yeah. I think... That's the ingredient yeah. that you use. So for those of you looking to start um, uh, business, you came back, pineapple, you probably heard, oh, exporting pineapple at work. That wasn't your passion. Yeah, that wasn't my passion. And you face frustration and bam, mm. you let go. Mm. But when you have passion for it and you have the talent for it, those are the key ingredients mm. to spell success for you. So on that note, we're going to have a quick break. When we come back, We'll get into NGOs. Stay tuned for Diaspora Weekly. What's cool, fresh and trendy with the new look? Makes you feel real good, that refreshing vibe. Satisfies you right just the way you like. Different, think special. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA.
Hello and welcome back. Uh, you're watching Diaspora Weekly on Diaspora Network Television. My name is Jermaine Nkrumah, and I'm delighted to be joined by Ambassador Shirley Abedi Boafo, okay. NGO specialist. <laughs> so now, talk to me about it. Most people, oh, I have an NGO, oh, I have an NGO. What that, take us to the basics. Mm -hmm. What is an NGO? Okay. NGO is um, non-profit making. Mm -hmm. Helping humanity, basically like that. Non-profit making and also helping human. It's like a, in UK we call it charity. Okay. But in Ghana we call it NGO. So sometimes okay. people get confused. Okay. But it's charity work. Yeah. Volunteering, you know, giving to the poor. It's all charity work. But when you go, technically speak, when you say non-governmental organization, mm -hmm. which is what the name stands for. I can be a non-governmental organization and, mm. and still be for profit. So why is it that the term NGO, mm. non-governmental organization, being exclusively dedicated to non-profits? What's the connection there? In, in Ghana, when we say, um, in Ghana, when you want to set up, um, let's say an NGO, mm -hmm. you start with registering at this, um, what's it called, registered general. Mm -hmm. And when res registered general is it's called um, the, um, what's it called, um, Company limited by guarantee, mm -hmm. and the and the um, the aims and objectives. Every NGO, every charity is not for profit. Mm -hmm. So when we say not for profit, doesn't mean that, for instance, if you are, you are um, run a training, doesn't mean that you are not going to charge. Mm -hmm. You will charge, but all the money that come, you have to put it back in the in the charity. Okay. So that's basically non non profit. You don't. So you in your financial statement, you don't declare a profit. You don't declare profit. Okay. Yeah. You, put it you, back in the. If what you put in for the year. Mm -hmm. It's less than what came in. Mm -hmm. The difference, what do you call that? Um, can you say that again? Like if you put in, if you, the whole year, mm -hmm. it cost you 100 cities mm -hmm. to run the organization. Yeah. And the charges, the contributions that you mm. made were, say, 110 cities. Mm. Clearly, there's a 10 city it's difference. There's a 10 cities, yeah. That's, that cannot be called a profit. That cannot be called a profit. What do you Obviously, call you, can, you can have overs. Okay. But it's not, it shouldn't be a very like profit, like buying and selling. And your main aim is you, you, are, you want profits. No, okay. it's, not, it's not like that. So it's sort know. of like a surplus. A surplus, okay. yeah. But you have to make you put it back into. Yeah, the surplus. Yeah. Be. That's okay. the idea. Okay. But what's the name? So what's the name of your NGO? Okay, my uh, NGO is called National Consortium for Voluntary Organizations. Okay. National Consortium for Voluntary Organization, and you deal only exclusively with NGOs. With NGOs, right. NGOs, um, social enterprises. Okay. Yeah. So you yourself are an NGO. Yes. But you 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 have a consortium. Yes. Why is there a need for such a consortium? Okay, there's a need for that in the sense that, um, as you are aware, I've lived in the UK for some time, and in the UK, um, before I set up this organization, I was working with, with a nonprofit organization called. Back in the Dagenham Faith Forum. Mm -hmm. And because um, NGOs or charities are not for, for profit, mm -hmm. there's a lot of support for, I'll use charity because in UK we call it charity. There's a lot of support for charities in UK because obviously you don't buy, you don't sell. If somebody is going for a training, let's say they're charging 100 pounds, you don't want to charge them 100 pounds because where are they going to get their money from? You know. So um, I was working in this particular organization. I realized, oh, wow. So they support a lot of charities in the UK. But mm -hmm. I, do, I don't see this sort of, sort of support in, in Ghana. Ghana. So why don't I replicate it, bring this idea back to Ghana? So that's the main reason why I came to Ghana. To so what kind of support, for example, mm -hmm. does a, a charity support group offer? OK, with our talk about our organization. Mm -hmm. we, support, we give them mentorship, consultation, training and sometimes funding yeah okay if i decide that i want to um register an ngo mm -hmm. in my head i have a clear-cut idea of what i want to do with an ngo mm -hmm. or with my ngo mm -hmm. why do i need you <laughs> mm. well um you need us in the sense that sometimes you might not you might not have the right structure mm -hmm. I don't even know where to start from. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, there's so many changes in the nonprofit sector that lots of people are not even aware of it. So you might decide to, you know, 
register it. But along the line, you might need, everybody needs help along the line. Right, right. I asked you because until you told me about this, mm -hmm. I really did not, uh, I'm not in the NGO uh, realm, but I anticipate there are a lot of people who have registered because it's an, oh, just register an NGO to do, but the dynamics of running an NGO and everything, if you don't know, you may have an NGO on your hands and you have absolutely nothing to do with it. Yeah. So why don't you take a minute to talk about some of the things that need to be done by NGOs, the things that they need to know mm -hmm. uh, that from your research they probably don't know. Mm -hmm and that the opportunities that are there mm -hmm. that they may not be taken advantage of, things like that. Let's spend some time to go into, let's start with opportunities. Are there opportunities for NGOs that NGOs in Ghana may not be aware of and are not taken advantage of? Okay, Opportunity, opportunities like, um, there, there are lots of resource organizations in Ghana that lots of NGOs um, are not aware of. For instance, there's one called, um, West Africa Civil Society Institute. Mm -hmm. They have an e-directory mm -hmm. whereby when you put your organization's name on it on, or what you're doing on the donor, the donor community can find you there. But lots of people are not aware of that. Well, say that again. Yes. So a lot of people are scratching. I have an NGO. Who well, am I going to get from? But you say there's a directory yes, there. Yes, a directory. And if you put your name there, put your name. money will find you. No money will find you. Okay. But I mean, donors, donors if the, there's lots of organizations around the world mm -hmm. who also support organizations in Ghana. Where do they go? They'll have to look for um, a directory mm -hmm. because, mind you, I remember when I was setting up this organization, I could not find a very good, um, what's it called, data. Because sometimes you go on the internet, you see an NGO's um, what's it, name, the telephone number is there, the telephone number is wrong. Hmm. But this particular um, organization I'm talking about, their data is... Let's say about 80% correct because so obviously... So they vet, they vet the uh, NGOs that they put on there? They don't particularly vet, vet them. Okay. But you are the one who will give your information to them. To so them. It, it's up to you, the organization, to, to go back to tell them that, okay, I've changed my telephone number. Okay. And, and stuff like that. Okay. So well, that's one of the advantages. And secondly, there are also a lot of other organizations. For instance, our organization, we give training, we, give, we do cons free consultation and all that. That's an opportunity, but people, people are not even aware, aware of that of we are there. Yeah. Until you come to an, a, a program like this to talk about, people are not aware. So there's so many, much opportunities okay. out there, but people are not aware. Are, okay. are Can aware. you give us the name again of that directory? It's called West Africa Civil Society. West so it's Africa called WACSI. So, oh, okay, Waxi. West Africa Civil, Civil Society. Society. But if that is the place that donut community uh, participants go mm. to find out more about NGOs, how do they know that the NGOs populated on that directory mm. are legitimate NGOs? Okay. There's another, there's another one also called, um, the government one is called the NPO Secretariat. Th th on that particular website, they have um, a section called uh, Not in Good Standing and, and in Good Standing. So in Good Standing, the ones listed on the Good Standing is the ones that have, you know, renewed their license, uh, what's it called? Um, uploaded their uh, what's it called? Yeah, returns and everything. So that particular one is more legitimate. To be okay. honest. That particular one is more legitimate than the waxy one. Okay. Because that one is is under, under the government, and before you they put you under um, in good standing, they have to make sure that you've satisfied all the the, the requirements. And yeah. you say that one is MPO. MPO Secretariat. MPO Secretariat. Do you care to go into what the a national? It's a non-profit organization. Non-profit organization. Secretariat. Secretariat. Okay. Yeah. Good, 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 good. All right, so what value chain, what value does your organization bring to, say, clearly when you came down, you saw that the support to NGOs, or shall I say the support to charities in the UK, you didn't find the same here in mm -hmm. Ghana, so you've set that up. Mm -hmm. How cooperative have the NGOs been with you? <laughs> um... Mm. Well, those who, I would say that those, there are lots of people who are very serious, especially mm -hmm. the, the NGOs that we are working with, those are very young people. How many do you have in your consortium? We have about 90, 94 at the moment. 94, 94 okay. at the moment, yeah. Right. We have some even join us from Sierra Leone, from Cameroon and all okay. that, yeah. 
So then you should be, just like NP, uh, DNT, when we started, we were looking at Ghana before it blew up. Mm. Now we have the African diaspora, yeah. because these things, they take a mind of their own. Yeah. Can you say the same about yours? If you have people joining from Sierra Leone, mm. I'm sure. Yes. Uh, so d during the pandemic, we did about, I think about eight online training. Okay. And when we advertised on Facebook and stuff, people joined. Okay. So through that, they become part of our ne network. I don't know whether they don't have that, this particular, um, what's it called, help in their countries, but they've joined us. So sometimes they'll call you, I need this. Do you have to, can you explain this to me and stuff like that? Yeah. Wow. Well, support group for NGOs. That, that's a new area for me. Um, but again, when you brought it to my attention, I started to look at how, because businesses need support. Yeah. And so it stands to reason that NGOs <coughs> would need support. Were you surprised that until your arrival, there wasn't any such thing? Well, I wasn't, I was surprised. I was surprised. There are some there, mm -hmm. but I don't, know, I don't know why it's not out there. You really have to. But there are a lot of coalitions out there. Mm -hmm. For instance, they've got water and sanitation coalition, mm -hmm. health coalition, but our own is a general one. A general one. A general okay. one yeah. All right. So we support across the board all the categories. Of do, you also, do you also support um, um, having the, the paperwork right, making sure that uh, they've crossed their T's and dotted yeah, their I's? We do okay. that. We do what that. about forming? How do, if I wanted to start an NGO right now, how do I even go about it? Okay, so the fir f first and foremost thing is, what is the need? Okay. You have to know the need first. You know the need, and also um, sometimes, for instance, people will think, okay, um, I want to run an orphanage, I want to help street children. But sometimes there's so many street children uh, organizations along the line. So sometimes I say that if you think there are so many, why don't you talk to somebody and collaborate with them and, and join them because there's so many mm -hmm. along. The, mm -hmm. So first of all, you have to find, is, is, there the, is there a need for what I'm doing? What if I create a need? Oh, I think people will need, hmm, <laughs> I think people will need ABC. Let me create an NGO for it. What stopped me from doing that? If it's not a legitimate, it's a, just a need that I sat somewhere and said, <clears throat> I think people will need this. And then I'll go and register an NGO. You might struggle because if there's no, who are you, what are you going to do? Okay. Why are you going to support? Okay. So there must be, there must be there a must need. Be a there need. must be a need. So you identify the need and you uh, establish an NGO. I will say this, and I'm, I'm not supported by any facts or any statistics, mm -hmm. but I've heard that a lot of people register NGOs mm -hmm. when they get the funding the problems are neglected. Can you speak to that? Um, <laughs> I haven't come across <laughs> such things, you know, but at the end of the day, if you create an NGO, let's say you've got funding, you want to support children, okay? You get funding. You don't use the money for what it asks for. Mm -hmm. The donors, you, you have to give them reports. Because if you don't give the report, the money is not going to come back again. That means you can't run the organization again. That's it. Right. Right. That's it. Because I see a country, I live in a country in Ghana mm -hmm. where you, can, you can't pull up at any traffic signal without at least five children yeah. approaching your window begging <coughs> and everything. And I am sure somebody has an NGO to take care of. Mm. Have you come across an NGO that takes care of street, oh, yeah. street children. Oh, yeah. In our, in our network, you have about two or three um, angels that takes care of street children. So is it because they're not getting funding or what? Why are the street children still there? Sometimes it's, it's a cut your coat according to your, your size. Right. So you can't, you, if you're an NGO that supports street children, you can't support the whole street children in Ghana. Yeah. So maybe they've set up an NGO to support street children in their area. Let's say I live in a, maybe um, Tesano. In my area, but that's what my capacity can support. Okay. Because at the, at the end of the day, in Ghana, there's no funding from anywhere. So the little money that I have, I can't support the whole Ghana. So where I am, I said, brighten your corner where you are. <laughs> where you are, you just support them. Mm -hmm. that, that's but how then, it goes. Uh, <clears throat> conversely, there are NGOs who are actually doing uh, the work that oh, they're yeah. supposed to. Because, and here, our... Uh, I'll take the opportunity to um, mention um, uh, former 
Minister for Gender, uh, Dr. Otiko Jaba. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with her NGO yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, about disability. Yeah. And there again, there's the passion. You can tell mm -hmm. she's passionate about it. And we've gone to several of her events where she's mm -hmm. literally begging people to donate yeah. something to yeah. give her wheelchairs and everything. Do you, see that, do you see that passion? Is that passion prevalent in the NGO industry? Yes, it is. Really? It is. Majority of the people that we support are young people. Okay. And trust me, they use their own money. They mm -hmm. use their own resources. <laughs> their passion is there. Okay. We have the genuine ones, trust me. Right. I just gave you an example of Otiko. Can mm. you give me another one that has really struck you? Um, there's this particular um, NGO in our, in our network. Mm -hmm. um, it's a youth organization. So what they've done is um, they talk to their friends and they just get little donations from them. And then the, what, they, what they get, they use it to serve, the, serve their community. And so for somebody like that, mm. <laughs> if, I mean, if they... If they do actually doing the work mm. with just little money resources, here and yeah. there, mm. those are the people who actually need the funding. Yeah, yeah. And so, in, the, in your system, uh, what what are some of the things that you're doing to help them get the uh, significant funding for them to? Okay, we, what we do is we, we help them to put their structures in place. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you, you're an NGO that supports children, we have to make sure that you have all your child protection policies. Okay. Your annual returns, you file your annual returns. You have all your policies and stuff like that. So what we do is we bring experts. For instance, this is Friday gone. We did an, um, an event called Ghana Nonprofit Connect. Mm -hmm. And we got someone to come and talk to us about um, fundraising. Because somebody might think, well, fundraising is just taking the paper and pen. And it's not like that. There's more to it than that. So we try to bring experts to talk, talk to us okay. about the things that we need to help us run our graduates effectively. Okay. Well, before I go on a, quick, a, quick, uh, a break, we got about... Uh, a minute to go on a break. Why NGO? <laughs> I know you have the passion for it. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's voluntary. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a family to maintain. Mm -hmm. Why that instead of an actual for-profit business? Uh, I th well, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's a calling. It's okay. It's definitely a calling because I, I have other businesses, but no matter what I do, my attention, my focus is on the NGO. Because I know that if we, in Ghana, for instance, you can take about 10 children. Mm -hmm. How many of them even goes to school? Yeah. There's a lot of need in Ghana. Yeah. That I believe that when we support these NGOs, Ghana will be in a better place. Okay. That's a lot. Yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot. Yeah. yeah. We live in, okay. Well, we, we'll come back mm. to <clears throat> the part that the government play uh, in, mm. you know, a lot of uh, the stuff that the NGO currently in this space uh, are doing. This is Diaspora Weekly. Uh, we'll go on a quick break and we'll be right back. Pop. speak to you. I know the stress people go through when they want to send money from abroad to their family members and loved ones in Ghana and in even Africa. See, if you are in the USA, eh? if you are in London, UK, Canada, you know, Europe, any part of the world, see, tap tap send has made it very easy. All you have to do is to tap and tap and send within a twinkle of an eye your money will be sent with no stress it's very fast convenient and easy to access everywhere what are you waiting for just tap tap and send <laughs> download tap tap send now on google play and app store tap tap send it's secure convenient easy and fast <laughs> Uh, you're watching Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine Nkrumah, and I am delighted to be joined by Ambassador Shirley Abedi Boafo. And it turns out, with the ad that just ended was Top Top Cent. It turns out you're a, a patron of, uh, you use Top Top Cent. Yes, I do. How does it work? Well, um, obviously, you create an account, uh -huh. you put your bank details in the account. Mm -hmm. So, all the money, for instance, with me, I've linked my, my UK bank account. 
to the app. Mm -hmm. So if I want to transfer money into CDs, I just go into the account, transfer money, and then they come to my mobile money. Mobile money. Mobile money. It's sitting in your office. Wow. Tap, tap, sent. Anyway, before we went to uh, the break, you were talking about the, um, what the, the need that's here for uh, the NGO space. But then we live in a country where everybody, not everybody, but the majority of the citizens believe that all problems need to be solved by the government. Can you speak to that? <laughs> If, even in the, in the Western world, problems cannot be solved by the government. They have, uh, they have charities. Yeah. Um, I, I, charity Commission in the UK, that regulates the charities in, in Ghana. So in UK, mm -hmm. did a research in 2014, finding out how many people have, have used the services of a charity, 40%. Hmm? <laughs> Ch charity Commission uh -huh. is an organization that regulates the charity sector. Is it a government? It's a government okay. that regulates the, the charity sector in UK. So in 2014, they re did a research to find out how many people have benefited from the service of a charity. 40% of the people in UK said they have at one time, either themselves or their family members have benefited. If you were to do, I mean, you haven't done that researching, but if you were to do that in Ghana, what do you think that percentage would be? 80%. 80%. 80% of Ghanaians have taken advantage of... Uh, um, have benefited. benefited either themselves mm -hmm. or somebody they know. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, so yeah. then the charities are doing it. Oh yeah. But, but do we have? Um, you said, no. What, what organization do you call that in UK again? Charity Commission. Charity Commission. Mm. Do we have a, a, a similar government entity here in Ghana? That? That's the NPO Secretariat. Uh, the NPO the Secretariat. NPO Secretariat. Okay. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, now you're back, and you are a diaspora returnee. And you are at home because this diaspora network television. Mm -hmm. How has your return been? Is it all you dreamed of, or uh, is there going to be a second time that you're returning to the UK? No, second. I'll, I'll start from the second time. Mm -hmm. There's no second time that I'm going to because, as I said before. Mm -hmm. I'm very passionate about what I'm doing, so nothing is going to stop me. Nothing is stop you. Nothing is. So going under to stop no me. circumstance would you go back to the UK. No. Okay. Yeah. When this I go to the UK, I go on a holiday. On a holiday. <laughs> okay. This is this is this is uh, this this is interesting because uh, <laughs> there are people in the diaspora listening to you right now, mm -hmm. and they have a short stamina. When they come back, things don't work. Bam, they're mm -hmm. going back. Mm -hmm. And they write off Ghana and everything. So why, why are you writing so hard on your passion that absolutely nothing can cause you to return to UK? So as I said, um, what I'm doing, I know it's needed in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I've seen the impact. Mm -hmm. I've seen the impact. And I'm also passionate about it as well. Okay. So within me, I, feel, I always tell myself that I am, which at the You're moment, needed here. I'm needed here. Okay. I'm needed because, as I see, as, as I said, the benefits of this the sector is enormous. Okay. Some of them take them to schools, medical bills. It's needed, as I said, even in the, in the Western world, charity work is needed. Let alone, yeah, in in our country, yeah. Ghana. Yeah. So w what we are doing is needed to be able to help our our country. So how do we change the paradigm? Again, I asked in a, in a country where everybody thinks problems need to be solved by the government. Mm. But you're saying that even in developed countries, how do we change the paradigm of the Ghanaian that, look, these pro the government is doing enough. Maybe we should look at the NGO sector for some of these problems. Yeah. How do we change that paradigm? Awareness. Okay. Awareness, because that's the way there are three, three parts of society. Okay. We've got the government, we've got the business, and we've got the non-profit sector. But unfortunately, Ghana... What sometimes um, worries me or disturbs me or makes me sad is anytime we are talking on TV or radio, we talk about business, government. I've never heard people talking about the nonprofit sector. If you take a pie, mm -hmm. a pie of 100%, mm -hmm. and divide that pie into three, mm -hmm. as you said, mm -hmm. one, one piece for government, mm -hmm. one piece for business, mm -hmm. one piece for NGO, mm -hmm. how, in your in your experience, mm -hmm. what should those percentages be? Hmm. What percentage 
of the role in the lives of Ghanaians mm -hmm. should the government play? And what role should business play? Percentage, that mm -hmm. is. And what percentage should <laughs> the NGO? This is just an estimation based on your okay. assessment. Um, so I'll say um, the government will play 60%. 60%, okay. And then, um, no, 50. 50%. 50 business 30 and then 20. And, okay, so yeah. 50, 30, 20. 20 yeah. The people who work in that, uh, it, or people who draw paycheck, mm -hmm. or people who work in general, how, what percentage of that mm -hmm. work in Ghana mm -hmm. work for the government? And what percentage work in the business sector, which is private mm -hmm. sector? And what percentage work in the NGO? And, and, and I'm going by your 50, 30, 20. Mm. In other words, do you think you have 20% of the workers in Ghana mm. drawing their livelihood from NGO? Mm. Is it up to that much? Um, sorry, can you repeat that question? Okay, again? I'm saying that mm -hmm. you just say that from your calculation, uh, when it comes to problem solving, 50% mm. should be by the government. Yeah. And in other words, the rule that 50% uh, mm -hmm. and the business should take 30% mm -hmm. and NGO should take 20%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that reflect in the employment? No. Do you think 20% no, of no, no, workers no. work in the No, it doesn't reflect because in the NGO sector, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are work voluntary. Okay. So it doesn't reflect. It does, okay. But with the, within the business and the government. They draw paychecks. Yes, okay. but in the NGO sector, it does not reflect. But even but we want to try, want to try and change, change that narrative. Yeah. Yeah. But, but why is it that mm -hmm. if I have an NGO, mm -hmm. why should I rely exclusively on voluntary help? Because there, there's a lot, because obviously, as I said, not for profit. So it, 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 it depends a lot on funding and donation. Mm -hmm. And because of our system, we don't have the right system, the right structures in place. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult, difficult for them to get the, the fund that they need okay. to be able to run against effectively for them to even to employ somebody. Right. Do you understand what right. I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So, so, okay. So then, then there's a lot that needs to be done in the NGO space. That's why we are there. So, okay. So then give, tell us, how do you take us to that point where you want us to okay. go? Okay, so that's why we emphasize a lot on training mm -hmm. and building structures and having policies in place. Because when you're an NGO and you have your right structures in place and also the training, because at the moment, even in the Western world, they are, they are getting away from depending on donors. We have to create a sustainable organization whereby you should be able to, when you don't get the fund, you should be able to fund yourself. So these are some of the things I want to put in place after doing the training that you have to find a sustainable, you have to be sustainable. So whereby if you don't get funding, you have to be able to run organizations. Else if not, you have to fold, you know. Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, again, uh, let me revisit the balance sheet. If I have a thousand cities come in in a month, mm -hmm. my expenditure, I should be able to say, okay, I had a secretary who took this. I had uh, spent this on fuel, I spent this mm -hmm. on fuel, this and that, mm -hmm. and run it all the way down. Mm -hmm. And if that cost comes to uh, 960, then maybe four, uh, 40 cities is the surplus yeah. that I can put back yeah. in. But those costs mm -hmm. should include workers. Yes, it should. But the, the money is not enough okay. for you to you know, pay some. Some organizations have got staff, but not... I would say about 20% of NGOs in Ghana have got paid staff. Okay. Majority haven't got paid staff. Okay. Majority. All right. Finally, uh, diaspora returnee, how much support are we getting? Are you getting? And <laughs> um, from your vantage point, does the government, in a, not, the, not even the government, mm. the Ghana, the mm. system in Ghana, mm. What level of support do you think it has for diasporans who have returned with a passion such mm. as yourself? If, I, if I'll be honest, at mm -hmm. the moment, mm -hmm. no support from anywhere. No support from anywhere. Okay. Yeah. But uh, the only support I've gotten at the moment is mm -hmm. um, 
I've gotten a recommendation letter from the press diaspora affairs. affairs office. Yes, that's okay. that. I've got a letter that I need to take to the um the social welfare to okay. for them to know that we are here, we exist. Letter of recommendation. That's that is one. that is a, that is actually good to hear. Yeah, that one. And I've got and, it. and so, what would you advise other would be um, diaspora yeah. returnees yeah. to say? Hey, when you come there, go to that office. They can help you. Yeah. That's what I that's what we, I did. Okay. That's what I did. I said, okay, if I'm not going to get um, um, money or funding, at least I'm a diaspora, so I need to go to the place for mm -hmm. them to give me that. That's because when you go on their website, that support is there. Is that there? yeah. So I just went there myself, you know, book an appointment. And you went and there. And I went there. And, and you I received in, the help. I received the help. Okay, yeah. so you can provide accurate testimony that. <laughs> Despite what people say, oh, Ghana, when you come here on your own, there is help there. Yes. Are there Find the right place. Find, go to the, because that's what it's set up to do, to okay. support us, you know. Correct. And if you get a letter of recommendation, because, um, what's, um, uh, what's it called? Social welfare is the body of assist NGOs. Mm -hmm. So if you get a letter of recommendation from the president's office, that, okay. you know, for them to recommend you, at least... That, that says something. Yes, Very that good. says something. Yeah. All right, so we've come back. I want to thank you for uh, making time to come see us and talk to us. But I want you to spend the next minute looking at that camera and tell anyone, would-be NGO <laughs> uh, managers, what you want them to know about your company and how you can help. Okay. So um, our organization is called National Consortium. Voluntary organizations and NCV Ghana for short. We exist to support, promote the NGO sector. So, any organizations there who's looking to survive, who's looking to thrive, you can go on our website. Our website is www.ncvghana.org. Send us an email, come and see us. We'll support you through your training, through, uh, through our mentoring <laughs> consultants. Any support that you need, just send us an email and then we'll support you. I have actually gone on your website, and it is very impressive. Uh, and if I may, we, if you can repeat that website again. OK, here it is. Uh, ncvogana.org. ncvogana.org. Go there, very impressive website, and they will give you all the help that you need. And at this point, I really want to thank you for educating me and our viewers. I think you've told us a lot about NGOs that personally I didn't know uh, in the past. And now I'll start to look at NG. I'll start to look at NGO differently. Ambassador, Your Excellency, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank Very you for good. having me. This has been an edition, a special edition of Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine Nkrumah, and stay tuned for our continued programming. Hey, you simple team, my simple citizens. Don't worry, I said we'll hook it. Can we push on these silly things? Charity begins at home and own the world from citizens. Yeah, you're the Yahoo Taki, set it to jinx. Yeah, 
We need peace, no ratatata. Stop the beef, it 